proteins are some of the most interesting organic molecules that we get to talk about. The reason proteins are so interesting is because they have highly varied functions. There are a lot of different functions of different proteins. Proteins are responsible for providing energy. They're responsible for catalyzing reactions. They are involved in transporting things in and out of cells. They're necessary for the movement of cells or for the movement of items inside cells or even for the movements of muscles. All of that depends on proteins. Proteins are important for communication. They serve as receptors for different signaling molecules and they serve as signaling molecules. They can have a structural function. There are many parts of the cell that are built from proteins and more. All of these are different things that are done by proteins. Now keep in mind that a molecule's function depends on its shape. Shape determines its function. Because there are so many different proteins with so many different functions, it follows that there must be a whole lot of different shapes. And that's really one of the most important things about a protein is its shape. So we're going to take a closer look at the structure of proteins to see how they take their final shape that will determine their function. Let's start with the basic unit of a protein. All proteins are made of amino acids. That's the basic unit of a protein is an amino acid. An amino acid is a relatively small molecule, but it's fairly complicated. It's got a lot of little pieces. All amino acids have the same basic structure. They all start with a central carbon. So we've got a carbon in the middle of each amino acid. Connected to this carbon, we have a hydrogen, we have an amino group, an NH2 group, that's why it's called an amino acid, because of the amino group, and we have a carboxyl group. Now remember that a carboxyl group is actually a weak acid, so that's where the acid part comes from in the name amino acid. We have our central carbon with a hydrogen, an amino group, and a carboxyl group. That leaves room for one more thing. The last thing we have in our central carbon is called the R group. R just means remainder, it means whatever else is there. We have 20 different amino acids that have different R groups. So the R group is going to determine which amino acid you have, and there are 20 different options for what sort of gets plugged into that last spot in our amino acid. We classify amino acids based on the properties of their R groups. So all amino acids are relatively polar because they all have that amino group and they all have that carboxyl group. But we look only at the R group when we're trying to classify amino acids. And some amino acids are called nonpolar amino acids because they have nonpolar R groups. For example, shown here are alanine and valine. These have R groups that contain only carbons and hydrogens. And remember, things that are only carbons and hydrogens are nonpolar. Alanine and valine have nonpolar R groups, so we call them nonpolar amino acids, even though overall the molecule has a lot of nitrogen and oxygen in it that makes it. The polar amino acids are amino acids that have polar R groups, like the lysine that we can see on the screen. You can see that the lysine has an amino group as part of the R group. There's the nitrogen, and that's going to make this a polar R group. We even have positively charged and negatively charged amino acids, and you'll recognize them by seeing that they'll have a positive or a negative in their R group. The reason these R groups are important is because it's the R groups that are going to eventually determine the shape of the protein and that, of course, is what's going to determine the structure of the protein. First, we have to be able to string these amino acids together. When they're just a bunch of separate small molecules, it's not a protein yet. We need to join the amino acids together. Amino acids are joined together by a dehydration reaction. So we're going to remove a molecule of water in order to join two other molecules together. They're joined together by a dehydration reaction between the carboxyl group of one amino acid and the amino group of the next amino acid. That joins two amino acids together, creating what's called a peptide bond. We can then do another dehydration reaction between the carboxyl group of the second amino acid and an amino group of another amino acid, and we can continue stringing 
amino acids together between the carboxyl end of one and the amino end of the next until we make a whole chain of amino acids. A chain of amino acids is called a polypeptide. And we can see here a polypeptide where we've got our chain of amino acids hooked together from carboxyl to amino, carboxyl to amino. And the R groups are just sort of hanging off to the side at this point. So you can see in these orangish boxes, these are the R groups, and they're not doing anything yet. They're just hanging off the polypeptide chain, this string of amino acids. The R groups become important when it's time for this polypeptide to fold up into its complicated three-dimensional shape. It's interactions between these R groups that hold a protein together in its three-dimensional shape. And there are lots of different interactions that can happen between these R groups. There are some types of R groups that form covalent bonds. We can actually have two R groups at two different points in a polypeptide that come together and form a covalent bond. We also can form ionic bonds between R groups. Remember that some R groups have a positive charge and some R groups have a negative charge. Since positives are attracted to negatives, we can have two amino acids at different points in the polypeptide, but their positive and negatives are attracted to each other, and that will bring in those ends together and start folding up this polypeptide into its final shape. The polar R groups participate in hydrogen bonding. So you can have a polar R group in one area and a polar R group in another area, and the positive and negative ends of those groups will be drawn to each other in a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are really important for maintaining the proper shape of proteins. Finally, even our nonpolar amino acids are involved in some way in helping form the final shape of our proteins. And that's because we have to remember that proteins exist in water. So we have water all the way around our proteins. And we know that nonpolar items don't like to interact with water. So our nonpolar R groups tend to fold up toward the middle of the protein where they can hide instead of pointing out towards the outside. These are called hydrophobic interactions and they help determine the final shape of the protein as well. On this slide, you can see that they're showing the string of amino acids as sort of a string of beads. And here, each bead is representing one amino acid. And then you can see how they start wrapping together into complicated shapes. And, and we have turns and twists and spirals. And this is going to be the complicated three-dimensional shape of the polypeptide. For a lot of proteins, we would be done now. It's one polypeptide that makes the functional fully shaped protein and it's ready to go. For other proteins in our body, it actually takes more than one polypeptide connected together to make a functional protein. And so we have to take multiple polypeptides and they have to be held together in order to make the protein. These different polypeptides are held together using the same types of interactions that hold the three-dimensional shape in the single polypeptide. So we'll have um, sometimes covalent bonds between different polypeptides. We might have ionic bonds between a positively charged amino acid in one polypeptide and a negatively charged amino acid in another polypeptide, holding those together. And even hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions are important for holding different polypeptides together to make the full shaped protein. The example that you see on your screen is the protein hemoglobin which is found in our blood and is responsible for carrying oxygen. Hemoglobin is made of four polypeptides joined together. In this drawing, one of them is shown in red, one is orange, one is blue, and one is green. Those are the four different polypeptides, and those polypeptides are held together to make the fully formed hemoglobin protein. I just want to emphasize again how important the shape of the protein is to its function. Anything that you do to a protein that changes its shape has the potential to change how it's going to function. Sometimes you can change the shape of the protein and it will function better. Sometimes you change the shape and it won't function as well. There are many different things that can change the shape of a protein. One simple thing you can do to change the shape of a protein is to change the temperature. As you heat up a protein, because all of the molecules and atoms start moving a little bit more quickly, it can actually break apart some of those interactions holding 
the amino acids together and it can cause the protein to unfold. That's called denaturing a protein when it unfolds. And increasing the temperature can denature or unfold the protein and then it will no longer be functional. You can change the structure of a protein um, with detergents, detergents or soaps. So remember those nonpolar amino acids are all hiding in towards the middle because they don't want to interact with water. When we add something like a detergent to a solution, the detergent can interact with the nonpolar parts and that can cause the protein to unfold and let some of those nonpolar things come towards the outside. So that can affect how well a protein can work. We can change the pH and affect what's going on with the proteins. Now remember what pH is. pH is the potential of hydrogen it's the amount of hydrogen ion in a solution. When we start adding extra hydrogen ion to a solution, it can actually start forming bonds with the protein and disrupt some of the hydrogen bonds that should be happening or can interfere with some of the ionic bonds that would otherwise happen. So when you make the pH too high or too low, because it affects how those hydrogen ions are gonna be binding to positives and negatives and hydrogen bonds in the protein, the protein structure can change and that will change how well it functions. Proteins typically only function well within a pretty narrow range of pH. Physical stress or physical tension can affect protein shape. There are some proteins in the body that detect um, pressure or that detect tension and that's because the protein structure changes based on how much pressure or how much tension it's experiencing. You can unfold proteins by shaking them as well because that can knock some of these interactions apart just like changing tension or changing pressure can affect the interactions between the amino acids and that changes the shape of the protein and that changes how it functions. Protein shape and therefore protein function can be changed when something binds to a protein. So there are a lot of proteins that start in an inactive form they're not active, and then when something binds to them, maybe a calcium ion or something like that, something binds to the protein, that causes a shift in its shape, and now the protein is more active. Or there might be something that binds to a protein to turn off its activity. The protein's functional and working, and when something binds, the protein changes shape, and then it stops working. That's a really important mechanism of regulation of protein activity inside your cells. And the last thing I want to talk about that can affect the protein shape and therefore its function is changing an amino acid. Changing one of the amino acids in a polypeptide can affect how the protein folds up. Here's a specific example. In the protein hemoglobin, which as I said carries oxygen in your red blood cells, a single amino acid change causes the disorder sickle cell anemia. So we start with our polypeptide, our string of, of amino acids, and we can just change one. Just one of these amino acids can be changed, and when it's changed, the protein no longer folds up quite the same way. Instead of folding up into the nice shape of hemoglobin, there's a little piece that sticks out because it can no longer interact the way it's supposed to. The problem with that is that little piece that sticks out is a little bit hydrophobic and wants to hide which means it'll sort of clump up to another hemoglobin protein, and then that one will clump up to another, and another, and another. And in sickle cell anemia, these very slightly different shaped hemoglobin molecules end up clumping up and forming long crystals and strands that distort the shape of the cells. And that's what actually causes the sickle-shaped cells, or the odd-shaped cells that we see in sickle cell anemia. And this interferes with the ability of these cells to carry oxygen around the body. Another example of changes in protein shape is spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease. In spongiform encephalopathy, the amino acids in the protein are actually correct, but you have a version that folded incorrectly. So you have an incorrectly folded version of the protein. This incorrect the folded version of the protein can bump into correctly folded versions and adjust their shape and grab onto them. And then this bigger clump can then go on and bump into another correctly folded protein and change its shape and attach to it. And you end up forming these huge clumps of proteins that end up killing neurons in the brain and that leads to um, the symptoms associated with uh, spongiform encephalopathy.